All right, this next interview is, is one that I'm really excited about because when I first started this show, I had dreams of what the show would be like and what kind of stories we would tell. And a lot of times we've been fortunate on this show. We've had Medal of Honor recipients like Woody Williams that was just on the show. We've had Kyle Carpenter and Dakota Meyer and many other Medal of Honor recipients. But a lot of times through war and through uh, just the way that history falls, we don't have the opportunity to hear stories that are lesser known. And some of those stories are just as remarkable as the ones that have high levels of valor, like a Medal of Honor. This story is different. Um, this gentleman that we're about to interview, his son reached out to me and showed me one article, and that was basically all I could find, which I found to be shocking considering the awards that he has, like four distinguished flying crosses, which <laughs> is unbelievable to me. So without further ado, we're going to have someone who rarely, if ever, has talked about his combat experiences. Jim Dunn is joining the show. Jim, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Looking forward to talking with you. Now, I want to get in, before we get into some of your combat escapades and your combat experiences, I want to talk to you because you're a Vietnam era veteran. Is that the reason why you were quiet, even amongst your family, about some of your experiences that you had? Well, to be very frank with you, when I came back from Vietnam, I was uh, injured. So I was carried back in a stretcher uh, all the way to Kentucky where I got out and went up to visit my family eventually. It was, uh, I wasn't, I didn't really get the walking out of the terminal, walking out of the plane. I mean, it was all just grateful. I had great receptions. Uh, all the, I was on a hospital plane. So everywhere we landed, everybody came out to talk to the veterans. And I, had, I literally had no idea that things were as bad as they eventually were when I finally got out of the hospital. I gradually saw that occurring. But to make a long story short, uh, I had a lot of things that I really wanted to share with people when I left. But when I started to see the reactions of the people, I really felt strange and uh, just wasn't certain they wanted to talk about them. And to be very frank with you, nobody really asked. <laughs> it was a strange uh, situation. You know, I, I had a, the best example I could give you is when I eventually was able to walk, I walked, uh, had crutches, I went to a party when I got back to my home in Detroit, Michigan, and I showed up in my crutches. I hadn't been around my buddies for a year and a half. I got there and someone said, hey, I understand you were in the Army for a while. By the way, how are the Tigers doing? That kind of thing. And, wow. You know, it just wasn't, wasn't something I wanted to pursue. I, I kind of find myself, quite frankly, be someone uh, who doesn't like to toot his own horn. And I, I find that, to me, that's heartbreaking because I can't imagine keeping my stories in because they shaped so much of not only who I am as a man, but just my worldview and how I view things, how I view government, how I view politics was all shaped by what I saw in a combat zone. And I'm sure that you were the same way and keeping quiet about that and feeling like nobody wanted to hear to me, it's heartbreaking. And that, that, that trip you took with the Red Cross, it wasn't just a short little flight. <laughs> that was a flight from <laughs> Japan all the way to Kentucky. On, you sit on a stretcher. Yeah. Even I was that. on a hospital. Yeah. It was incredible. I, I've got to tell you, I'll never forget, as long as I live, being on that hospital plane where they literally had surgeries ongoing. They had operating rooms set up. And I had the honor of being with all those uh, you know, returning wounded soldiers. I was the very bottom <laughs> of the last of the plane. I, and I froze my butt off, quite frankly, all, all the way back because I was so close to the door. But I wasn't about to say anything with all the medical things going on around me. It was incredible. I, I bet. And, and it's kind of breathtaking, like to be around. I remember being in the Fallujah Ambulatory Center where people um, we're getting ready to be transported out to Bagram and different places like that after losing limbs. And I'm sitting there just with a, I got shot through the arm and I was thinking, man, I, I don't deserve to be in the same room as these guys and what they're going through. And I'm sure you felt kind of the same way. Like there, it's, it's always humbling to be around other warriors because you, you get pointed out for sacrificing something and you know, if you're still alive, you know that there's people who sacrifice much more. Absolutely. I, I feel exactly the same. I, my injuries were minor compared to those injuries that I saw and tended to, I'm sure, much like you. And you went on after your career in the Army, 
you went on to become a lawyer and we'll get into that a little bit, but you had a successful career after you left. But I want to get into some of the actual stories because when I was reading through some of your citations that your son was nice enough to, to go over, I saw that you had 1600 hours of combat flight time. Is that correct? That's correct. 1,632, actually. <laughs> and I know a lot of the people are, that listen are military and enlisted folks, so I'm going to do the math for you. That's, that's almost 67 complete days of combat operation hours actually conducting combat. Now, thinking about it from the war on terror perspective, whenever I would go into a, a combat zone like Afghanistan or Iraq, we would usually be gone for three or four days at a time, but a lot of that wasn't happening where it was continuous your the nature of your job could you tell us what the nature of your job and what each and every moment of those 1600 hours kind of felt like well remember i came from the ground i was an artillery forward observer and i was with a unit that had a lot of combat initially when i got there and survived so people thought i was capable of doing my job so i got got this offered because they wanted to have a combat experience person. They took these, these soldiers, four or five of us, and put us into these positions. We flew OH-13 helicopters and the L-119 bird dogs. And we were on station. The 1st Infantry Division used us all the time. I mean, I, I had many days when it was 20 hours of flying. And the only reason it wasn't 24 is because we had to stop and get fuel and uh, use the bathroom and things of that right. nature. And, and it was incredible. We, were, we, we flew low where appropriate to draw fire and to you know, help mark, mark targets. And, and we, were, we were so good that the uh, artillery virtually was involved in every single situation we had. It was much more of a jungle scenario where we were. It was very hard to, to see. When I was originally a Ford Observer, I learned to I just fire by sound, quite frankly. Wow. And uh, I couldn't see any, anybody in the jungle uh, on, against us. I saw a lot of my own troops getting hurt, but it was very hard to see anybody shooting at you. So and, we, and this just, area is just so different than what the modern warrior goes through now, too. Because I, I was picturing myself when I was reading through some of your citations and trying to kind of wrap my head around it and put myself in that position. But being in a jungle environment like you were makes it so much more difficult because I saw that at times, whenever you were a forward observer in the air, essentially, you would have to be able to identify enemy versus friendly forces, sometimes as close as 17 meters apart. Yes, we were, we were right at tree lines on a regular basis. And you're referring to a situation that occurred on the first day of the Tet Offensive, actually. Yes. Where I literally, uh, along with my pilot, we were engaged in, in literally ground warfare. We were probably 25 feet high taking on a platoon of uh, North Vietnamese and doing pretty well at it. We survived and get shot down and yeah. we took, you know, we, we inflicted some casualties and saved some lives and that, that span. And that, that from there to 2000 feet, 2,500 feet where we normally adjusted or down as low as a thousand sometimes or 500, we went as low as we needed to go to get the job done. And see, I find that remarkable for me as a ground guy who spent my career in combat actually like fighting on the ground if i had the opportunity and i was in a helicopter i'm not sticking around like in a lot of those situations i probably would have flown up high into the clouds and got the hell out of there well i must admit there is you know, there was a tremendous uh i i just was with people that had such a desire to do things well it just swept us up uh i hate to sound like a you know like a religious zealot but we were, were literally uh, just carried away by our enthusiasm. We were probably a little stupid and too cocky, but it was probably that type of attitude in some instances that might have actually saved our lives because as you know in combat, you know, with the minute you hold up or the minute you, you, you let up, the minute you start to get nervous, that's the minute the problems start. You just, you, you have to really be bold in most situations in my opinion. And when you were flying through, so as a, for your job, so for those that don't look, you're looking out of the helicopter while the pilot is flying and you're trying to spot the enemy so that you could, in some spots where I was reading where you're throwing smoke grenades as a, to, in order to spot, so artillery sees where to take out the enemy. Was that something that took, how did you train for that and how did you learn it on the fly essentially? Because that's not what you originally did. 
No, you really didn't train for it. Interestingly enough, uh, it was probably more common. When we flew in the helicopter, we always flew in a helicopter with two controllable scenarios. We had armored seats, which eventually saved my life when I was wounded. But we, we because it was often, we weren't sure who was going to get shot. And uh, as a forward observer going to an aerial observer, they basically taught us how to fly at the plane and the helicopter in the event we had to get it down because the pilot was, was not with us. Uh, it never happened, to be honest with you, but it could have. Uh, it wasn't, you know, the interesting thing is in, in, in Vietnam, uh, you were, you were um, just contained. Once you had an operation that started and you started to get into combat, you didn't want to leave. You wanted to be there. You wanted to be the eyes and ears of the guys on the ground that couldn't see, you know, beyond them that they're in this jungle clearing, that there was a clearing 50 meters ahead or that, mm -hmm. or that, uh, you know, that they were dropping bombs that we, we would call, we would also act as facts on occasion and, uh, you know, bring in our own jets. And we flew low often because it was impossible to see anything high, quite frankly. And, and we got used to it. We, we, uh, there was, you know, we had a couple of planes shot up, even shot down on a regular basis, but we, we were, were literally asked for on every single ground operation we could. There were a total of five of us. Three of us basically were on a regular rotation. We were every single day, probably 20 hours a day, we could have flown for a unit that wanted us. The priority was always to go to combat. And the interesting thing is, looking back, I was probably in combat every day. Uh, for hours, you know, many hours, sometimes 24 hours or more. Because once we got in combat, we didn't want to leave. You know, once we were, we were the eyes and ears of that forward observer on the ground who couldn't see ahead of him, who didn't know where he was at, didn't know how to adjust the Air, Air Force jets and the Army uh, gunships and so forth. And, and that was, it fell to us often to do that. And, we and, did it and with that amount of time that you're in, heavy engagements, how did you stay focused? Because I know a lot of guys that we talk to, a lot of ladies that we talk to, they will say, you know, like complacency starts to set in. When you're leaving Camp Fallujah, or you're leaving Marja's bases, whenever you're going out, you have these huge signs that say complacency kills. How did you, that many hours of day for that long of time, how did you maintain focus? Well, I, I know this might sound a little overwhelming, but we were often, I mean, most of our time was engaged. We did have situations arise where we weren't as focused, but we weren't anywhere near combat either when that was happening. We were just, I can remember one time literally flying an L-119. I wasn't the pilot, I was in the back seat, and we were watching a convoy. Well, the convoy was about as boring as you could get. <laughs> and uh, we, you know, we had, a, we had a situation develop where we lost a wheel. Well, I, I don't want to describe it any more than that, but it was a little difficult to account for it. So we had to find the enemy somewhere to get shot at so that we could justify having the wheel gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you get in trouble if you came back without it. I mean, that's exactly. the way it goes. <laughs> So we so, were very engaged. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. And then can you walk us through the, the moment of another, the day that you were actually shot, whenever you on another low flying mission, can you walk us through what happened there? Sure. So in, in uh, the first infantry division in Vietnam, you, the division was located at Lai Kay, and to the north was the Cambodian border, probably 50 miles away, heavy jungle and uh, the occasional clearing and anything north of that, for all practical purposes, was the enemy. To the south was Saigon, another 30 miles away, 40 miles away. Different brand of uh, different situation. So this operation was in the, on the 5th of May. In fact, it was on my birthday. Mm. And uh, this was after the Tet Offensive, after we had had that, a tremendous victory, quite frankly. But it wasn't viewed as such in history, but nonetheless it was. But in, you talk about engagement, that was a 48-hour engagement, that particular situation. Well, we went down to help a mechanized infantry unit. It was very rare that a mechanized infantry unit could go anywhere but roads or jungle. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were in a rice paddy because it was in May, and this was the dry season. The, the uh, monsoons wouldn't start till a little bit later in the summer. And going... They were going across uh, rice paddies, uh, basically. Still moist, but not anywhere near flooded. 
And uh, our job was to be available. It seems almost absurd, but there was so little cover that it was amazing that in one particular tree line where there were probably a, maybe 10, 20 yards of shrubbery, you could hide a, a Viet Cong uh, a, a company, basically. It was probably about 30 guys, uh, maybe a platoon for them, maybe not very much company for them. Make a long story short, we, we flew over the convoy and we were headed to this, to this uh, growth of trees to see what was there. We were too low because we didn't think anybody was there. And when we got there, the, right over the tallest tree, and I looked right down at a 50 caliber machine gun mm. and knew that we were in trouble because that baby was yeah, that can hum. capable of shooting us down. And they, everybody that we were with thought there was nothing there. So I immediately got on the radio, told the commander what was going on. He immediately increased his speed to try to get there. And we started to go up. And the mistake that we made going up was that we went up we pulled up almost immediately and turned to the right. And of course, that's a deadly error. But in order to mark the position, we had to turn around and go back rather than keep going up. And we did. We turned around and went back. At the same time, we were trying to gain some speed, dropped uh, smoke grenades on the location, and uh, received 50 caliber machine gun fighting as the, as the indicator. So we knew we had the right spot. The bullets were hitting the canopy they were hitting the armored seats we were still flying and uh suddenly we worked we were headed down and uh, that's basically all i remember quite frankly but i'm told that we landed in a in a rice paddy and uh basically worked our way out waiting for the for the uh armored mechanized infantry uh, to come and join us uh, we were the helicopter was on its side. Myself and the fellow flying were on the other side, and, and it's my understanding he did not survive. Wow! And did you get shot? Did you get injured by shrapnel, or did a round go through? No, I round went through my foot. Took out. My Damn it! Major. See, I hate when somebody's on the show that had got shot with a bigger caliber weapon than me. <laughs> <laughs> Fifty cal, unbelievable. Yeah. Well, it took, wow. I'll tell you. When it went through my joint on my right foot, the major joint, it took out the whole major joint. I thought my foot was gone. I looked down and my toes were pointed to the, the shoe was pointed way to the right. And I thought, well, did it go through like your Achilles? Before. Like you're through the Achilles? No, no, it was right at the main ball joint uh, okay. where you step by your toes. It had come through there and, and it just took off the, it, it didn't take off the toes, but it took off a big chunk of what was behind the toes and it put it, took care of the, the boot so that. The boot, in effect, was flopping to the right. The, the front had been there, and I was hanging on by skin of the second, third toes, basically. But it was an interesting, it, you know, and then we, I got to the field hospital, and from there I spent some time, uh, a couple days before they could get me to Saigon, and then it, and then it was a couple days before I could get out of Saigon uh, to Japan. When you because woke up the, in the hospital, because you said that you didn't remember, you were just laying there on your side. When you woke up in the hospital, what was some of the first things that went through your mind? Do you remember? Sure. Uh, what happened? I wanted to know that we won the operation, which we did. I mean, it was basically a, a small skirmish to start with, but I have a feeling, you know, it turned out that there was a lot of heavy weapons involved, and the North Vietnamese were the soldiers involved, so they, they were fairly, you know, they probably got caught, quite frankly, in an area that they weren't prepared for because they never would have been in such a small amount of, of brush. I mean, it was literally, uh, couldn't be no more, no more than a, than a, a house lot is, in, you know, hundred by 200 feet, but they had a lot in that thing, including a, a number of 50 calibers. And one thing so that I, I picked up on that you mentioned that I used to as well too, you mentioned the mistake that was made whenever you were trying to fly up that you're going up and to the right. Is that something that you Monday morning quarterback for a long time where you thought about the tactical mistake that was made? You know, I did, quite frankly. I, I, I thought we, you know, we should have stayed down and uh, would have been a lot harder to hit us. We could have come back over the top lower. Uh, we went in low and we surprised them. That worked out well. Um, but when we went up, we just were sitting ducks because not only did you go up, you could see us, but you also slow down. And uh, we're already in an OH-13, which is probably 100 miles an hour anyways. It's not, a, it's not a hard thing to hit once you slow down even more with the 50 caliber. 
And you said you, the pilot that you were with was KIA that day, correct? Yes, correct. Did can you describe what your relationship was like with a uh, with a pilot before something like that happens? Out obviously. Well, he was a uh, you know we had we we stayed with the pilots that we flew with, so we knew all the pilots and their abilities. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, he was a, a good guy. Uh, had flown a while, but because. They flew the entire time they were in Vietnam. It took me six months to get into this position. I didn't. Uh, and there wasn't quite the camaraderie with the pilots that there was between the observers. And in order to be an observer, you had to be selected literally by the commanding general of the division, and uh, you had to have a lot of combat time. So a lot of the pilots, of course, had never been on the ground uh, in, in combat. All the observers had been. And you had done with things them. with the Big Red One. That was the unit that you had deployed with. That's correct. I was with the first of the 16th Infantry. And uh, Big Red One it was a great fighting unit, great esprit de corps. And it was when I was on the ground, uh, again, we were in, in uh, action all the time. We would come back occasionally for a few days at a time uh, to get beefed up with personnel and rest a little bit. But it wasn't long before we were back out there again. And so you go from there after you get home from the long Red Cross flight from Japan um, to get back to the United States. You end up getting promoted. You do a tour in Korea as well on the DMZ. And then you come back to America again, where you are the captain of, the, of a, an, a, a company commander, essentially, of an artillery unit. And then you decide to get out of the military. Now, somebody with your level of awards, your level of accomplishments, because during that time, I mean, to rack up four Distinguished Flying Crosses, to have a Bronze Star, a Purple Heart, um, an Air Medal with a, with a V, that's five, six Valor devices in one deployment, which to me is mind-blowing. You get out and you become an attorney. With those level of stories, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, I don't know how you keep that bottled up like I, I i try to put myself in the position of the vietnam era warrior and i just can't i i don't know how you i can't stop talking about my experience especially if i have a couple beers <laughs> <laughs> like i will talk I about it a lot and it's it's i just don't know how you, was it a struggle for you to keep that internally or what did it just become second nature well i two things uh, Actually, I was still in the Army when I got out of the hospital, and uh, I went to Fort Dix, New Jersey as a company commander. For an, When I was in, in Vietnam, I'd actually had a spell for a, about two and a half weeks where I was the platoon leader and then eventually the company commander of the company that I was in there because the company commander left under some sort of an injury, but we weren't in combat or anything like that, but you know, I, I acted as the company commander. And uh, it's funny because years later, I ended up getting awarded the uh, MOS for the infantry. So not only was I an artillery officer, but I was also a, a company, an infantry officer. But when I came back, I went to, uh, after my deployment Which there, is nice because nobody I, can call you a pogue anymore. That's exactly <laughs> right. So I, I went to Fort Sill for the officer's advanced course. But before that, I went to this this, uh, work job at McGuire Air Force Base, right next to McGuire Air Force Base, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And I trained uh, soldiers going to Vietnam, helped train soldiers going to Vietnam. And so I was still in the Army. I was still in, com I had a great camaraderie with people. And I had a couple operations on my foot in the process. And so I had people to talk to. It wasn't until when I went to uh, officer's career course, then I went to career for a year and got out. It wasn't until I got back in the civilian world that, that I felt a little lonely, quite frankly. It was hard to explain what was going on. Um, you know, when you're around a bunch of soldiers uh, and, you know, you wear your, your dress uniform, you got a few ribbons, mm -hmm. and you know people because they came back from where you were. So, you, you know what they did and, you know, they know what you did. Uh, it, it wasn't as hard to adjust. It was really hard leaving the military, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I did it. Because I, when I got to Korea, I, I loved my assignment. I was right on the DMZ. And uh, literally, we looked right out at North Korea from where I was at. And uh, it was, uh, we were constantly in a state of, uh, of readiness. And I loved it. 
and I realized quite frankly that I was probably addicted to this stuff mm. and uh, maybe, maybe I needed to take a break for a while. So I went home and that's when I found no one was interested. It, it just, in fact, it was just the opposite. It was like, boy, are you stupid? You went to Vietnam. And it was uh, something I just kind of mulled over inside me for a while. I had a great family who always uh, brought it out uh, one way or the other. You know, I had a chance to talk to my uncle who was a World War II soldier and uh, on a regular basis. And I think he was helpful and instrumental in, in giving me some, some ability to, to function as a normal civilian. And not just like a normal day-to-day -day life, but the career path that you chose with, with dealing with academics and be becoming a lawyer, it's even more so, I would imagine, where you had to keep it in in that time period of what you had experienced. Because I, I can't imagine at law school, they were exactly pro-Vietnam at the time. No, no one was. And I, and I, I got to tell you, you were right on the money. No one not only was not pro-Vietnam, no one talked about it. I mean, they weren't interested. It, it was very rare, but I had a couple of buddies I, I got to know, and uh, they were always interested enough to ask me how I was doing, and eventually it usually led to some sort of a discussion. I drank too much, mm. and, and uh, that was my solution, and it wasn't good, and uh, it's a lesson I learned. It was a hard one, uh, but eventually I stopped drinking, and that made a big difference uh, at the time, and I was very, uh, again, very fortunate to have a great family around me. I've got, you know, I've got the greatest sons you could possibly want. They're all, uh, and you can tell they love really, you. Like just the messages that I've gotten that, that they're immensely proud that you're their dad. And I think that that's awesome. Whenever I look back on my life and get to the stage of the life you're at, I hope my kids look at me the same way when they're adults. And I, I think it's fantastic. And it shows resiliency to come back from the combat that you had while not being able to speak to someone. I can't imagine where my life would be if I didn't have the opportunity to go to counseling and things like that. And so many from your generation just had to essentially suck it up. And I can't imagine how difficult that was. It was, but eventually I made it to the counseling. I did all that. I, my wife has been you know, right there with me all the way, even now. Uh, you know, I, I just uh, recently, maybe a couple, well, a couple of years ago, was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease as a result of Agent Orange. And uh, I've had that kind of situation, you know, bladder cancer, Agent Orange. So the military hasn't left me. But I'll tell you what, it was the greatest experience of my life, and it made me what I am. And I'm, I'm just proud of the fact that I served with the people I served with. One of the most interesting things, and I, I, I shouldn't just monopolize this, and I apologize. I served with two Medal of Honor winners. Wow. Two Medal of Honor winners. Now, that's, that's the kind of people that were around me. <laughs> that's that, That's incredible. Who? Who was it? Well, the, the first one was a fellow by the name of Pinky Durham. He was a Ford observer. And uh, he was there at the same time I was. Uh, I was what a name, old Pinky, old. man. Yeah. And he, he literally died calling the artillery in on himself because he was getting overrun. And oh, it was yeah, an I awful remember, situation. That. It was really bad. And then the other person... It's a great story, if you don't mind me sharing no, it. No, absolutely. A little bit. It was a gentleman by the name of Charles Rogers, a black man, who Ooh. came to uh, Vietnam, came in as the S3, because I was billeted at the division headquarters, and he was the S3. And myself and another AO had gone out on a mission. And what often happened sometimes was that we were so far away, it wasn't didn't make sense to come back. We would just stay change pilots or aircraft and then stay out. We often stayed out for days at a time, uh, never really carrying anything, but in combat so nobody really noticed mm -hmm. anyways, if you know what I mean. Right. So we came back and the, the, one day the two of us were a little bit too cocky and a little bit uh, too wise. We came back and this, uh, this uh, S3 major wanted to see us, this, this Major Rogers. So we didn't know who he was because he had come while we had gone out. He was the acting S3. We went to see him. And with and all the stuff that you guys are doing, you're probably feeling like King Dinglings, honestly. You're not kidding. We are <laughs> feeling really cool. Yeah. Because we had, you know, we had the division commander on our side. I right. Mean, there were more, more than one occasion when I would ask the division commander to please call a colonel and tell him I'm supposed to be doing these things and basically telling him what to do. Right. So, uh, Major Rogers 
said, you know, you guys have terrible radio contact and all kinds of stuff. And make a long story short, we locked out of the building and we looked at each other and said, man, this guy is never going to make it. This mm. is awful. If he still pulls that stuff, he's just not going to go anywhere. And people are going to, you know, really have trouble with him. Well, six months later, he won the Congressional Medal of Honor. So he did all he right. Assigned, <laughs> he did a great job. He was assigned to a unit in the Big Red One and uh, an airfield up by the Cambodian border and led a counterattack after a couple of human wave attacks that literally demolished his uh, compound and his artillery pieces. And, uh, and, and he ended up leaving the service as a major general, the highest ranking uh, minority officer or minority person ever in, wow. uh, the, in the military. Great guy once we got to know him, but we had been foolish and wrote him off because of what he told us about our radio etiquette. <laughs> yeah, nobody likes to be told their radio etiquette sucks. I, I, I know that for sure. So I exactly. want to, for the listeners that are listening while they're driving or doing whatever they're doing, you're wearing a purple heart hat. How long did it take you to get to the point where you would wear that? Uh, I would say about maybe the last five years. Yeah, that's kind of what we, we always talk about. When is it going to be okay for, for me to throw on the red retired Marine hat, the Purple Heart hat? And I, I always say, I think my age is going to be, I'll put it at like 63 or 64 will be my over under. You're not far off. <laughs> <laughs> You're right on the money. It, it's, it's an old man hat. But you know, the interesting thing is, for the longest time, as, as we played it, I, I, I didn't need somebody to tell me I did a nice job. The nice thing now is you would be surprised. I am shocked at the people that come up at times and say thank you. People mm -hmm. that, on a regular basis. And I got to be honest with you, I kind of like it, not only because of the thanks, but I can see they needed somebody to say thanks to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, was, it, it, it is nice. And I urge you to, it probably took me in the 60, middle 60s, and I'm 75 now, so I've been wearing it, what, five, six years maybe. You know, it'll take you a while. Put it on a little earlier. You might enjoy it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always make it a point. I still go to my medical stuff is still on base. And I, I make it a point to any of the older gentlemen there, the, the Vietnam vets, the Korea vets, if I'm lucky enough still to see a, a World War II vet, I always go up and, and shake their hand and listen to their stories while we drink a little coffee and wait for our medicine to get there. It, it is something that I think really bridges the generational gap because you have commonality like if you're ta if i'm talking to somebody from world war ii or korea or vietnam like yourself we all have these same terms that we still use we can all picture what it would have been like if we were there and i think that it, it that's the brotherhood the sisterhood that makes the military so special it is there's no question about it uh, you know the other part of this is that when i went to vietnam i went over on a ship and the interesting thing about the ship it was the the hh H. general gordon and we knew going to Vietnam that that was the ship that brought back all of the special forces troops that had been rescued from prison, mm. prisoner of war camps in World War II. And it was, it was like, it was, it was venerated. It, it just made me realize what a privilege I had to be going over as part of the 1st Infantry Division because it was, that was the same group that brought, was so responsible in Europe for saving so many lives. And, I'll never, I'll never forget the people I served with. If I remember anything, it's them because I don't remember much anymore. <laughs> yep, that's what people always say. I don't miss the Army or I don't miss the Marine Corps, but I miss the soldiers and I miss the Marines. That's, that's basically sums it up. And I think what you said there about the history is something special to be a part of. You definitely were that. Sir, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us and your son for reaching out and telling us your story. It's fantastic. You deserve every single one of those handshakes that you get. We appreciate you coming on our show, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I look forward to hearing more from you.